everyone. My name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California, and uh, I run regular free webinars and content for sexandrelationshiphealing.com with Rob Weiss. I also uh, have a private practice in Westlake Village, California, and my focus is to help couples and individuals in crisis. I'm an addiction recovery specialist, and I specialize in betrayal trauma as well. So this is a free webinar provided through We Tonglin's community. And I'm going to try to focus on <clears throat> helping you best understand the trauma that you are likely experiencing because of your relationship crisis and provide you some of the current treatment modalities of trauma treatment to kind of get you through the crisis into a better state of mind, physically, emotionally, et cetera. This is applicable to uh, males and females. And I wanna let you know that relationship crises and the betrayal trauma that occurs as a consequence can come in many different forms. So I'm when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to you to anyone who has a partner where you have recently uncovered an unknown addiction or harmful behavior that that you didn't really know was happening or maybe you didn't know it was happening as often or as intensely as um, you just recently found out. So that could be uh, disordered ways of using substances, uh, disordered porn use, gambling. You find out your partner has been cheating or engaged in uh emotional improprieties with somebody else outside the, your relationship, spending money that you were unaware of, or just doing kind of anything behind your back. Because relationship crises usually occur anytime a trusted loved one, in this situation, we're going to talk about a primary partner, behaves out of character. So you kind of committed with to this person, you thought you were building your life with this person, there was this idea that you were teammates, you were consulting each other, you were putting each other and your family and your life building as a priority. Um, and then all of a sudden they behave and act in a way that really makes you question if they are who you thought they were. Um, are they safe? Are they stable and predictable? Because as I've mentioned a million times, our nervous systems, our bodies want predictable. We like predictability, consistency, in anything outside of that, our body, our nervous systems experience is very unsafe. Um, so relationship crisis also can be experienced as a trauma because usually these types of behaviors, these kind of nefarious behind your back behaviors that you feel like were out of character and surprising to you, usually a occur with a heavy dose of gaslighting. So that's when someone convinces you that your reality is not your reality and they need, they want you to believe a different reality. A level of manipulation, just straight out lying to your face. No, this didn't happen. No, I don't even know that person. Um, these relationship crises also occur with a heavy dose of your partner usually rationalizing his or her behavior minimizing his or her behavior, justifying it, um, or when confronted, when you confront him or her with these behaviors, these choices, there can be blaming you for it, blaming it on something else, just anything other than them taking accountability and acknowledging the harm of their behaviors and what it's caused. So I want you to all understand and appreciate, and hopefully at this point you do understand and appreciate that your body stores these experiences as trauma. And it's important for you to, to realize this because this is the foundation of kind of understanding what all the treatment that you're going to be seeking out from here on out, what it's all for, what you're trying to treat, what you're trying to heal. Um, trauma will get wired deep in your body um, anytime it, your body feels overwhelmed with something. Um, and so a traumatic event can be loosely defined as any of the following, something that you feel your nervous system just feels overwhelmed by. It doesn't know how to handle it. It catches it off guard. Um, it feels blindsided by it. 
it feels maybe ill prepared to handle it. Like there's a powerlessness element to it that I just, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to handle it, how I'm going to fix this, um, what I'm going to do about any of this. So you don't feel prepared to handle the situation, handle the threat. Um, there is a real or what's emphasized is a perceived threat, right? There's a traumatic experience when you're held up at gunpoint, right? Because there's this true life or death situation. But finding out that your primary partner is maybe not the man or the woman that you thought they were can be just as threatening because this is your life. This is your family. These, this is, these are everything that's important to you. This is your reality. And it's suddenly getting turned upside down. Um, and also your, your body will store things as traumatizing if you feel scared, helpless, or that these are unique circumstances, right? The traumatic event is unique and it makes you strange or weird or different or disconnected from other people, which people who experience, you know, uncovering infidelity or addiction can absolutely feel this way. So betrayal trauma, I have several videos on betrayal trauma talking about what it is, how it occurs, the various ways that it's manifested in your relationship. But betrayal trauma is a subcategory underneath uh, trauma in general um, because it's a very complex traumatizing event that occurs because a loved one engaged in behaviors that were outside the realm of consistency and predictability, right? So there's external traumatic events, like we just recently they're on the news talking about the Hawaii fires and people running for their life. That's an external environmental traumatizing, overwhelming event that is going to absolutely be traumatizing to many. Um, but betrayal trauma is when it happens in the form of a relational rupture. I thought you were my person and you've now betrayed that experience and my body will record it deeply and strongly. And it can really bleed into that relationship from here on now. It can affect the way that you engage with them, um, your, your body reactivity, your, your feelings and sensations and storytelling in your head with that person. But it also will absolutely bleed into every other human relationship. Because as I'm going to continue to explain to you, our survival system is highly efficient. It fires off quickly and efficiently, but it is not accurate. One of the ways it tries to keep you safe is to just overgeneralize. If this one person can betray you, can manipulate you, can lie and bamboozle you, holy moly, I'm going to freak your system out so much. So you just assume everybody's lying to you, that you don't have the instincts and intuition to make any correct choice. And I'm going to cause you a lot of physical discomfort and emotional discomfort in an effort to make you avoid betrayal again, right? So what we always kind of say, your, your survival mechanism in your body is just there to help you survive. It doesn't really care about your happiness. It just wants you to stay alive. And so you can feel that miserable feeling of distrust, fear, um, worries and fear around being vulnerable, et cetera, unless you do this work to kind of move through betrayal trauma. So um, betrayal trauma comes in the form of destroying trust, safety, security of the bond, that's between you and that partner, it'll bleed into all other relationships. Um, betrayal trauma puts the betrayed partner in a deeply confusing quandary where the person they love and trusted um, is also the person who harmed them the most. It kind of makes your brain split in two to these two dichotomies you can't even wrap your brain around. It creates this torturous emotional roller coaster of do should I reconcile with this person? This, this is my person. Let's let's fix this. But at the same time, there's these waves of fear and disgust and rage towards either yourself or that person or the other people involved. And it just comes in a way that feels very out of control. And like those feelings overwhelm you and control you and not the other way around. 
And betrayal of trauma destroys trust, safety, and the security that contributes to um, betrayed partners losing, losing confidence in their basic decision-making abilities. And they it is very common for betrayed partners to just kind of, my entire reality has been wiped clean. I'm not sure who I am, what I'm doing this all for, what is my identity, what is my value. I, I just, I'm so confused, right? So one minute they feel like they're standing on solid ground and another minute it's all wiped away. Um, the symptoms of betrayal trauma can manifest as very deeply shaming. And I talk about that in another video, confusion, self-blame, blaming others, emotional instability, increased depression, indirectly kind of having other people be the recipient of your emotional roller coaster that maybe isn't involved in the trauma, um, difficulty executing basic functioning, just parenting, getting up eating, sleeping, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. So I just want you to all to know that as you move toward healing with or without your partner from here on out, it's important to realize that you have these recordings in your brain and body, these trauma recordings, and they will continue to impact all your relationships on, unless you really take the time to work through it. And I'm going to really fast forward to the end, which is that most trauma research says that you kind of need the same four elements to get through to the other side of the trauma state that you're in, this kind of deep wiring that doesn't really want to let go because it thinks it's going to keep you alive if it hangs on to this a lot. So the general overlap is that four things tend to need to happen to help you start working through and unwiring that. And we'll talk more about it towards the end, but you have to at one point acknowledge what happened, whatever the traumatic event was, whether it's a single event, like a car accident or a long-term event of 20 years of my partner lying to me and sneaking around behind my back, acknowledge what elements of it happened and what was not okay. So really, really speak up with that language of this was not okay. This is how I was harmed. Another element is that you need to have a trusted loved one or support group or a therapist or a 12 step group validate. Yeah, you're right. These things were not okay. The third thing is that there's a need to kind of re go over the traumatic events with some form of down-regulating system. And we'll talk about the various ways that professionals are doing that. So what, for better or worse, we kind of have to go through what was traumatizing, what wasn't okay, how you were harmed, but use down-regulating systems or interventions during that process. Um, in EMDR, they call it like taxing the memory because the more you kind of go over it, the less power it, it um has in your system. And then the fourth thing that is very important, and we'll talk about this, is there has to be this kind of narrative shift where you are able to create a story of empowerment around what happened. So it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm so glad I got cancer. You know, my traumatic event is, is the cancer and my fear for life, but it might be um, that I've had the opportunity to really reevaluate my life, reprioritize it, figure out what I want to do, um, reconnect with people. People have come out and said amazing, loving, supportive things to me during this fight um, towards healing from cancer. You know, there, there can be various, it doesn't need to be like, oh, I'm so glad this bad thing happened to me. That's not your story of empowerment around it. It's more like now that I know what I know, I'm going to use this education um, and new information to keep me safe. And I'm going to do it in the following ways. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about what's happening in your brain and body so you can understand. But again, I want you to know that I have a video where I talk about this in way more scientific uh, way that can be boring to many of you. Um, it's called like the fear, stress, trauma system. And I talk a lot more about like the mechanism of action. 
But I want you to understand the differences. So there's a lot of really uncomfortable hormones that come out when we go through fear, stress, anxiety, trauma, shame. They're all um, meant to kind of create really yucky feelings in us because it's asking our body to kind of change that state. We don't like it. It's scary. It's uncomfortable. But the one difference is, is that you cannot have fear, experience fear without some kind of stress response. However, people can experience emotions like stress, anxiety, and shame without experiencing a scary, fearful event. So those are the two things that I just kind of want you to remember is that a fearful, powerless, overwhelmed, blindsided, um, threatening experience, right? A fear-provoking experience will cause stress, anxiety, trauma, shame, but all those other emotions can all exist without a, a fear stimulus. So hopefully that helps you kind of intertwine or realize that those can be separated. So trauma is formed when the, a fearful event takes place and our nervous system records it in our long-term memory in a way that allows us to learn from these experiences, right? Because we are a species that's always learning and becoming more advanced. And it allows it to resurface and become triggered again, even when the threat is no longer present. So all of you guys are probably too familiar with what we call PTSD symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is like, you don't need the current threat to exist. You don't need the bear in the room to have the physiological response. You could just hear a song. You could drive down an old street, an anniversary, see a picture, and all of a sudden you're back into that state of like fear, of, of feeling traumatized, of feeling stressed, anxious, et cetera. Um, trauma is what happens when your, your system feels overwhelmed, when you feel loss of power, and you're not sure that you're going to um, survive it. Trauma can exist in either an acute, so that means like a single or a short-term incident, or in a complex system, again, long-term. So we need to appreciate that we have a very efficient but primitive survival system that's operating underneath all of this. So I'm not gonna go into extreme detail, but the things that are kind of operating at the core of all your trauma that you guys are kind of having to deal with day to day is our autonomic nervous system. That's that involuntary system that is running really fast and efficiently in our body. When it's not busy, just trying to get us to jump out of the car or jump out of the way of the car that's driving towards us to make us you know, live, it's a quick reflex. It's also running a bunch of other involuntary automatic systems in our body like heart rate, breathing, some sexual responses, digestion, immunity, some sleep cycles, et cetera. There's two branches. And so when I'm talking about how we need to go over our trauma story, but then use down regulation um, uh, interventions to help with that, there's two branches of the nervous system. It's the sympathetic nervous system. So it upregulates us, it increases our alertness, it ramps up our vigilance. So these are the things that create an automatic reflex to, again, like I said, get us to run faster. Or if our kid looks like he's going to jump in front of a car, grab him without even thinking. These are things we want the sympathetic nervous system, the upregulation system to occur. Um, the problem is though, when we've experienced extreme trauma, sometimes we get stuck in that upregulated system, increased alertness, ran, uh, high hypervigilance, et cetera. And we have to take a lot of interventions and tools to lower the system and bring on what we call the parasympathetic nervous system, which can help us downregulate, calm, move out of the state of stress and threat um, and, and calm our bodies down. So I want you to remember that the sympathetic state and the parasympathetic state. The other thing I just want you to kind of keep in mind is that we have this other thing called like an HPA access. It's talking about hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenaline, just appreciate, I was just talking to another client about this, that all these systems are, are, if they're normally functioning, help us, they help us kind of keep our hormones stable, um, help us seek out, oh, I'm thirsty, I need to go drink a cup of water, um, temperature, I need to go put a sweater on, um, they release hormones that are important, cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, 
when we wake up in the morning, we get a huge influx of adrenaline and um, stress hormones because it's supposed to be like, okay, wake up, move on, go do life, let's go. But if we are in a constant state of trauma, of uncertainty, of feeling like powerlessness, those are going to all get whacked out and they're not going to work the way that they're supposed to. Um, they So they can either be fast acting, like I wake up and I'm going to give you a little adrenaline to go move forward and function, or long-term where all day long, I'm in a state of hypervigilance. I'm going to have a strong irritability because if if you already wake up and you're right here and this is you totally losing your new, you know what, this doesn't give you much wiggle room. You're a few moments away from all of a sudden moving out of your prefrontal cortex, who I am as a person, who I want to be, how I want to show up, what I'm trying to do here. And suddenly I move into automatic reflex person where I'm just kind of punching in the dark, just trying to get safe again. Um, so I want you to appreciate too that there's, um, oh, and th this is one more thing. Important for you to realize that how these traumatic events get recorded in your body have a lot to do with how much support you received immediately. So throughout your childhood, so let's talk about chronic stress, chronic fear, chronic traumatic events, things that are going to be recorded as long-term tra traumatizing, scary things are going to be based on, did you receive support? Did you have a safe place to turn to when, when it happened? Did, were you able to get a chance to make sense of what happened? Was there any opportunity to be validated that what happened wasn't okay, a story of empowerment, et cetera. So when you're doing your trauma work, you're going to look back and realize that things that could have, would have, should have been traumatizing may have not been recorded as trauma because people reached out to you. They gave you love. They gave you support. They helped you realize it wasn't okay. They helped you move through it. But if you find yourself in a strong trauma response, it's often because you're lacking those things. Maybe your partner's not validating what you're going through. Maybe you, your home is not a safe place to be. You're not um, finding a group that is validating you and helping you structure a story of empowerment around it. So those are important things. Um, the last thing I want you to know is that there's this amygdala and it's the absolute dumb, primitive, general response of, you know, this is good. This is bad. I want this. This is scary. And I want you to just respect the fact that when you're sitting there, sometimes we sit there in shame going, oh my God, I'm never going to get over this. And this is always going to feel so dysregulating and scary and uncomfortable is that this is a reflex. It's a wired feared reflex. And as long it, it, it exists, but it is primitive and it can always be changed by the less primitive system in our body, our more advanced system in our body, which is our prefrontal cortex. So I'm gonna give you a couple pointers or a little bit of education, but the bottom line is that your fear response you, is a reflex. It is a learned reflex. Just like if I stepped on a tack or something really sharp, instantly reflexively without even thinking i'm going to put pressure on my other foot lift that foot up to make sure i don't feel that pain anymore but there'll be times that we can kind of talk ourselves out of that reflex by using our executive functioning so i just want you to realize that while it feels like you might not have power to assert agency in this situation You've been given another tool, which is this highly advanced system in our body, which is much more efficient, I'm sorry, much less primitive and um, kind of react without thinking part right here, right? This amygdala is that caveman brain and your prefrontal cortex is the brain that just slows down the thought process, uh, minimizes impulsivity puts things through the consideration of who I am, who I love, how I want to show up. And that is what we call the top down intervention that can help you with that fear trauma response that happens so much in your life right now. Um, so that's the first thing that I want to give you hope is it's, it's the power to trump or replace 
that fear wiring that no longer works for you. And that's the emphasis that no longer works from you, for you. There's a part of you that's going to want to stay vigilant. There's a part of you that for a while until your partner shows that he or she is very different, that they do things differently, they operate differently, you're going to want to hold on to that reflex to kind of ask questions, stay vigilant, hold healthy boundaries, um, think things through uh, s- slower. Those are all fear and stress and trauma and anxiety responses that might work for you right now. So it's important for you to start figuring out what of these fear responses are not working for me, which, which of them do I want to start working on moving out of and having a different reaction to. So that's important to figure that out. So one of the important ways, so speaking of that is to acknowledge what kind of narrative do I want to attach to this trauma and fear response? So let me give you an example. It might be that my partner's issue is that, you know, he had a sex addiction. He had a completely secret life that I was not aware of. Um, But at this point, he's apparently, he's going to groups. He has some sobriety under his belt. He's working towards being a better person, but he showed up late. He said he was going to be home at six o'clock. He showed up at 630. He didn't text me. He didn't write me. Um, and it reminded me, right, my my fear, trauma, stress response is going to be reflexively angry, upset, fearful that he's back to his old antics. Um, it's just going to be automatic. I don't need an actual threat to exist for me to reflexively feel unsafe because something happened that was not predictable, not consistent, and, and my body doesn't like it you'll need to attach a new narrative um, to find out, you know, it's, it's going to trigger you to say, okay, you're going to need more information. What's going on here? What are you upset about? Well, I'm worried that this behavior shows inconsideration is showing his priorities are out of whack. Um, he's back to doing secret behaviors. Those are all the stories you're going to be telling yourself. You need to slow things down and start really negotiating what kind of threat are we actually dealing with? Because remember, your amygdala is is primitive and dumb and generic. And you need to take your higher function and say, has there actually been a threatening behavior that's occurred? Well, yeah, there, there was an inconsideration that occurred. Okay, well, we need more information. And the more you gather this information, whether it's from talking to yourself, talking to your support group, talking to your partner about what happened, why happened, what's going on, how do we fix that? How do we stop that behavior? that will calm the nervous system down. Um, so you really have to kind of start, guard, that's your, your story of empowerment that you're going to create around that. Um, so much of your f- fear system is a memory system and you have to use your prefrontal cortex to reframe these memories, make meaning and find out what's protective, the parts that you want to keep in order to keep yourself safe now or in the future, learn from it, gain from it, and what is not in service of your healing journey now. This is a muscle that takes practice. It is very time consuming. It takes a lot of blood and oxygen. So it's going to feel like you are splitting your brain into six pieces. Trauma work is hard, but your muscles do start getting used to it and you start moving through that new narrative much more efficiently as time goes by. So let's just spend the last few minutes talking about what the current um, trauma interventions are. There's huge schools of thought that love this type of intervention, dislike this type of intervention. I'm just going to throw them all out at you. You can talk to your therapist or your professionals to find out what works for you or not. Um, But there's medication intervention, um, psychotropic medication, like an SSRI, benzodiazepines, all those do is stop or block the feelings or sensations that happen, the chemicals that get released in your brain. Um, They don't extinguish the source of where the fear reflex came from, and they don't change the, the memory circuitry around it. It just kind of blocks the uncomfortable feelings. There's people who are big believers in 
behavioral therapy interventions, such as like exposure therapy, cognitive processing, cognitive behavioral therapy. Essentially, those are exposures of the fear event. So if I got in the car accident, I drive to the same area where the accident occurred, kind of, or um, I knew someone who was afraid of flying because she'd gotten a, a plane crash. And it, exposure therapy is like going back on the plane, but using down regulation um, interventions to help diminish or lower the fear response. Um, <clears throat> and then ex and then replace the fearful memory with a more positive experience. Um, what's interesting and important that you have to realize is that you have to relearn a new narrative, a new association, a new framework with the fear engaging response. So let's say for the car accident, it's that created so much fear, the memories locked in reflexively. Anytime I drive in this area, I get uh, upregulated, dysregulated. Um, you have to actually block that fear reflex with a new narrative of I'm being careful, I'm, I know how to drive better, that was more of a fluke rather than a re regular common occurrence. I know how to keep myself safe now. I'm looking, I am safe, I am okay. So what's important is it's not just replacing, when you create a new narrative, a story of empowerment, um, you kind of talk to yourself from a new, better educated, more empowered state. You're not just replacing the fear experience. It's actually blocking the fear reflex, which is really, really interesting. I feel like that can make you feel more empowered to realize that I'm like blocking that, that fear invoking reflex in me by talking through it. Um, which brings me to a couple different narrative type um, interventions. So one of them is what we call internal family systems. And there's this idea that you kind of have these protective parts, you have these manager parts, you have these firefighter parts, kind of silly names, but all these different parts of you, some have been created and developed for our safety. Um, and we kind of sort through the childlike parts, the wounded parts, and we start figuring out what does work, what parts of us need to feel protection, negotiate with those parts. And really, as you can hear from this, this research is, is essentially what you're doing is you're kind of blocking out the really strong reactive parts and saying like, no, I'll keep you protected. I now have new information. Let me update you. This is how we're going to handle the situation. This is how I know to keep us safe. This is what we're going to do to protect us in the future. And those tend to calm those really reactive, fiery, fear reflex parts in you that are based on memories kind of seared into your long-term memory. So that's internal family systems. There's also um, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, and that is also um, subsets of that are also brain spotting that's done like in a more specific way, but it's this idea that you only need a general image or partial memory to kind of, of this upsetting event that occurred. You explore the negative thoughts, the shame stories, how you, where you felt it in your body when you went through this traumatic event. Um, and you use what we call bilateral stimulation um, to help downregulate you being kind of re-exposed very generally. Uh, to the traumatic experience and combining all those things helps your brain kind of move it more into a higher functioning memory state instead of a memory that will trigger a bunch of um, fear and anxiety and stress. Um, brain spotting does the similar thing, but in a very um, more specific way, like spots on your eyes. Neurofeedback is considered to do some of that downregulation as well. It's kind of helps apparently with like the reorganization of the brain. Again, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to take really scary, powerless, uncertain moments that were memories of yours that get lodged in your body and stuck in there. And you're trying to just actually move them from a memory that's supposed to create a lot of fear response, a little, a lot of anxiety and threat responses over to just a file that's like, wow, that was a really horrible thing that happened to me. It wasn't okay. Um, 
but this is what I've learned from it. And this is how I'm going to keep myself safe in the future. Other interventions are somatic experiencing. So the body holds the trauma and you create more empowerment and release the trauma through body movements um, while you're kind of re-exposed to the traumatic event. Deep breathing exercises, one of the best down-regulation experiences is to exhale. And um, that is what the parasympathetic system does. When you're exhaling, you are down-regulating your um, stress level. And so really putting time and energy of building that muscle in your body to try to exhale and engage that parasympathetic system. Some people will mix their trauma treatment with um, ketamine that's legal in California, um, psychedelics that is not legal yet, um, but they're exploring it in a couple different states. And then I will finish with one final thing, which is really interesting. Um, I definitely see it clinically. So it's interesting to see it um, be explained neurobiologically, which is one of the important things you need to heal your brain and body after trauma is to have a social connection with other people to manage the stress. There's a part in your brain called the tachykinin. It's a molecule in the brain that shows up when fear, stress, and trauma occur. And it helps to reinforce the circuitry in the, um, in the future. So tachykinin levels are further increased when you're isolated, right? So these molecules that cause this extreme fear reflex and stress reflex and trauma reflex are reinforced more when you're in isolation. But conversely, social social connection with those we trust and love actually lower the tachykinin levels. So I will finish this by saying that's partly why I run groups regularly, um, because I see there's a quite a bit of healing that can occur if a group is done in a safe and supportive and educational way. So I'll also close with saying, I'm going to ready answer your questions, but I have a 10 week life anonymous group that is starting next week, um, August 23rd. I think I have three spots left. It's a very small group. Um, I think it's going to be 11 people right now. And um, we kind of go over all this stuff. Uh, it's about the connection. It's about trauma healing. Um, it's about sharing your story. It's about focusing in on your your health, your healing, and rewiring your body through many, many different ways. Um, and we do it all through the book that I wrote with Scott Brasser from sexandrelationshiphealing.com um, using kind of classic themes of the 12-step model as a guide. And you can email me if you have any questions about that. But let's answer some questions. Thank you, Kristen. That was awesome. There was a lot of information there. I just, before we start, I just want to um, let everybody know that I personally have taken one of Kristen's groups, not the Life Anonymous, and it was very helpful. It was very helpful to get information from Kristen, but also to connect with other women. And then you connect not only the day that you do the group, but she keeps you connecting uh, through other resources and other venues. So it was definitely helpful. So um, anyway, okay. So first question, my husband hasn't acknowledged any wrongdoing and refuses to talk about anything that he's done concerning porn and flirting in private chats. D-Day was January 27th, 2023. He just clams up, clams up. How does one go on from that? Right. And, And I hope after this lecture, you can realize how your body is not going to be able to heal if this person remains in your same space in that same state, right? Because what we've said is necessary to move through trauma healing is that you have to be able to own that what happened wasn't okay, how you were negatively impacted by your partner's decisions, the betrayal, um, the gaslighting, the minimizing, et cetera. And he, ideally he's the one that will hear this and validate it and start creating more predictable, consistent, safe choices. Um, But as long as you're staying in that household where someone is actively minimizing behaviors, blaming them, et cetera, your your nervous system is not going to heal in that environment. But that doesn't mean that you can't do your own separate work and find uh, support groups 
and people who will kind of help you feel the strength and safety to set boundaries, hold boundaries, et cetera. But yeah, that's, it's overwhelming. It's terrible when your partner has betrayed you and then you get a giant tsunami second wave of, and this was your fault, or this really wasn't that big of a deal, or why don't you just get over it or what? I didn't do anything. So it's, it's very traumatizing and I'm sorry. My husband is desperate to return home after six months of separation. He is planning to give me the formal disclosure in October. How do I prepare myself for hearing the disclosure? I do have a safety plan afterwards, but. Yes. Um, I think you're already being very smart by preparing your body. Um, Remember the most traumatizing, the two elements that happen that make your body record it as traumatizing and create that those fear re- reflexes are usually this powerless component and um, a blindsided component to it. So if you already do know this disclosure is coming and you already do know that there's going to be concerning, upsetting things that you're going to hear, that's, you know, preparing yourself for that will help with the blindsided part. Um, you're not going to know exactly what it is, but you definitely know you're going to hear some upsetting things. And then the powerlessness component to it is that you are realizing there does need to be a safety plan. Expect to be dysregulated, expect to be upset, expect to hear stuff that's going to make you question if you want to move forward in this relationship or not. Those are all reasonable. But like I was mentioning with the tachykinin is social engagement with trusted other people who can hear you talk it through with you, um, not be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. Um, Just kind of go like, yeah, that's painful. That is brutal. I am so sorry. Uh, That will help your body not record it as as long-term complex trauma, but just more of an immediate um, traumatic event that you can seek safety for and feel better about in the future. And also try to find some um, good ways for outlets of finding out what does actually downregulate. Um, I did a video called um, Our Nervous System um, and how our nervous system is impacted by betrayal trauma. And I really try to help everyone realize that your nervous system is different than someone else's nervous system. Some people want to talk and talk and talk for hours and that helps them feel better. Some will just want to talk for a minute, but then they want to go for a walk. Some get a lot of healing from animals. Some don't want an animal near them. Some need a hug. Some don't want any physical touch. So really experimenting with what helps you actually feel more centered and downregulated, right? That parasympathetic downregulation experience is another really helpful preparatory tool you can do. My psychologist told him that he did not have an addiction, but a compulsion. And it was because he has missing love at home. He had been on porn chats the first time. Oh, he has been on porn chats the first time in five years. Not sure what to do. I don't have a support group. He promised to stop so many times. I cannot trust him. This happens a lot. Okay. Therapists and psychologists who are very well-meaning and who have the best intentions and are really effective in other areas of people's mental health lives are not trained in addiction. Um, so people could be unstable, the worst partners in the world, abusive, whatever. It's totally separate from the fact that your partner chose to cope with life or do life with secretive outside acting out unproductive, harmful lying behaviors. One is totally separate from the other. Your marriage and the stuff that happened in your marital dynamic has nothing to do with and never justifies the choices that your partner made outside the marriage. Um, And it's really important to separate those two things out. And it's also very, very hard for the marital dynamic, the coupleship issues to be dealt with and discussed until after the addiction or fine, you can call it compulsive behaviors. It doesn't matter. It's just bad choices. It's just a pattern of inconsistent, unpredictable, scary decisions that a person is making that makes me feel like I don't know who they are. They're not safe. I I don't know if this is the person I want to sleep next to or build a life with. 
that all has to get stabilized before you can even start talking about the marital dynamic. And it's really important to separate out those things. Um, you say you don't have a support group. I hope after this lecture, you know, you just, you need one. If home, if your partner's still acting out, justifying, rationalizing, making up excuses, blaming, you have got to go to a place in space where you can start doing these things that I've said during this lecture. Um, find a group, find people you can talk to. Um, it will help. Awesome, Kristen, thank you. As always. Yeah, I really thanks, appreciate it. You're always welcome to email me, Kristen Snowden, MFT at gmail.com or my website's kristensnowden.com. And check out our YouTube channel. There's a lot of information there. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.